Hey everyone, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the different distributions needed for the different types of statistical tests out there. So here's the idea. There are many different statistical tests that we're going to be talking about in this course, and each of them have assumptions that need to be met first in order to conduct those statistical tests. So this lecture, we're going to be talking about those assumptions. Primarily in this lecture, we're going to be talking about three statistical tests that are most commonly used and what their assumptions are. For example, when you perform a hypothesis test of a single proportion mean mu, which we'll be um, talking about later, uh, using a student's t distribution, often called a t test. So basically, when you have a one sample t test, there are fundamental assumptions that need to be met in order for the test to work properly. First, your data should be a simple random sample. So no bias involved. No, no other different types of sampling methods are allowed in this scenario. That comes from a population that is approximately normally distributed. Now, let me explain what that means. Consider age in the US. Is that normally distributed? Not quite. We, got, we have a lot of baby boomers, for example, and now we have a lot of young people, I guess. The, the, the population is not completely normally distributed. Um, so for that, for that reason, some of the tests are not going to work for um, if you're measuring the average age, for example, in the US. But the t-test does work because age is approximately normally distributed. Now, what does it mean for approximately normally distributed? Well, the good news is that if the sample size is sufficiently large, a t-test will work even if the population is not approximately normally distributed. Meaning that with t-tests, they will always work, even if the population um, distribution is not normally distributed, even if it's not a bell curve shape. T-tests will work if you sample high, uh, large enough samples. Uh, now, you can use the sample standard deviation to approximate the population standard deviation with t-tests. The idea is that many formulas that we're going to be using throughout um, the different statistical tests, some of them will use the population standard deviation in the formula. Now, it's impossible to calculate the population standard deviation because that requires you to do five steps. You got to find the average of the population first, then you have to find the differences from the average, then you got to square those, um, add them all up, divided by n minus one, and then take the square root. But if you notice in those five steps, step one is find the average, the population average. That's what you're trying to find. Like you're trying to find the population mean. So if you calculate the population mean, there's no reason to gather statistics or anything like that. Like it's completely useless because you literally found it. It's not like you're 95% confident or anything like that, which we'll talk about later on. It's you're like 100% confident because you calculated it. So uh, just note that the population standard deviation will be considered impossible to calculate. And so what we can do is we can take the standard deviation of our sample and we can use that to guess what the population standard deviation is. And we're going to be doing that quite frequently. Um, next up, when you perform a hypothesis test for a single population mean using a normal distribution, often called a z-test, you take a simple random sample, same thing, from, a, from the population. The population you are testing is normally distributed. That's super important. The population you are testing from is normally a distributed normally distributed. Now, this says, or your sample size is sufficiently large. Now, if you're taking statistics, there's a decent chance that your um, statistics instructor will say, a z-test is good if you have a, a sample size of at least 31 or 32, around there, then, then things should be good. That is complete crap. That is not true. <laughs> and I'm dead serious about that. Like, if you have the choice between a z-test and a t-test, choose a t-test every time. It actually matters, and there are several videos that I recommend you looking up on YouTube about why you should always use a t-test rather than a z-test. So this whole thing about or your sample size is sufficiently large. Now, the other thing I want to mention is about this, the population you are testing from is normally distributed. You are never going to find a variable that is perfectly normally distributed. Like, consider IQ scores, for example. Not even IQ scores are perfectly normally distributed. SAT scores are not perfectly normally distributed. And so, in general, Z-tests are terrible. 
And you're going to find this theme is very common in this course. Just don't touch these things because they make your math easier, but they're incredibly sketchy. Like if you do this on a research paper, people are going to look at you and say like, yikes, you're making a lot of assumptions that should not be made. So I personally don't like the, the Z test. When you perform a hypothesis test on a single population proportion, so when you're talking about proportions instead of averages, you take a simple random sample from the population. You must meet the conditions for a binomial distribution, which are um, there are certain number of uh, N of independent trials. The outcomes of any trial are a success or a failure, and each trial has the same probability of success. So if you guys want to rem uh, remind yourselves of what the assumptions are of binomial distributions, make sure you check out that lecture from earlier and remind yourself. Um, but other than that, these are the assumptions that are made for the three most common statistical tests used. Anyways, thank you guys so much, and I'll see you in the next lecture.